Um, I would like to start this session by introducing the chair for the next uh, session in this plenary room. And it's a very special lady for us and for Ina. It's uh, Diana Wallis, the former Vice President of the European Parliament and a real champion of 112 at times when 112, the European Emergency Number Association, didn't mean a lot to a lot of people, but she was there for us. So thank you for being here and thank you for chairing the last session. Thank you, really. Thank you very much uh, for that introduction. It's really a, a great pleasure for me to be back here uh, with Ina. It's even more of a pleasure as a Brit to be here on the 12th of April, <laughs> which is the second day when we thought we would no longer be part of the European family. But hey, we still are, so for a bit longer. Uh, anyway, this morning my task is to chair a session with Benoit Vivier, who is the public affairs uh, manager of INA, who is going to give us a presentation, uh, firstly about how European law is made, and secondly telling us what's in the pipeline uh, that affects the membership of INA and your work. And I think I just wanted to say in opening the session, to me it was always important as a parliamentarian to work with, and let's be clear, to work with lobby organisations that were transparent, enthusiastic, and technically competent. And Ina was all of those, all of those, enthusiastic, transparent, and technically competent. But above all, what is difficult as a legislator in the European area is that things are technical, but you have to relate them to the citizens that you represent. And that, to me, was always doubly important with Ina, because the work that Ina does, the work that you do, is so important to our citizens and is something that you can translate as a benefit of what the European Union does. So thank you for that. And Benoit, wherever you are, we're desperate to hear about what comes next in terms of legislation. Welcome and thank you. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, Diana Wallis, for being here today. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about like, the future of European legislations, because like, a lot has been happening in the last 12 months. So I'll be telling you a bit what has happened and what will happen for you in the next years. <laughs> so a few words about myself. Uh, most of you know me already, I guess. I'm Ines Public Affairs Manager, which you can also call a lobbyist, uh, but like a nice lobbyist. And uh, <laughs> I joined Ina almost four years ago. Uh, so it's my first, uh, fourth conference here. And uh, yeah, my job is mostly to follow EU legislation and to bridge with the European Union uh, institutions. Uh, as you can see, I have a background related to more politics and EU affairs, but it's my pleasure to speak with you about public safety also. And I'm from the most, most beautiful place in the world, uh, namely Nice, and I made this crazy decision to live in a super rainy city, but I'm still alive after four years. And I realized that like, it's not really appealing, right, to have like 40 minutes of presentation about like EU legislation from like a Brussels-based bureaucrat and so on. So to grab your attention, I realized that the best is maybe to show you a picture of my dog. <laughs> and maybe there will still some, be some, some more pictures of my dog throughout the slides, but for this, maybe there will not be. But for this, you need to follow the presentation that I will give. So first of all, I'd like to give you a small introduction about like kind of like what is EU, how it works, and so on, so that you can have a very good understanding of what I will say. I swear I will not bore you. It will be quick, interactive, and you will understand everything. So first of all, I'd like to mention some different kinds of legal acts that exist in the EU, because sometimes like we speak about like regulation, directive, and so on, and we don't really know what it means, right? So I'm just going to present some different kinds that exist. Yeah, it's kind of a mess in the EU. So we have... An 
mostly regulation and directive. Those are the two main um, EU norms, but there's like also a lot of ones. And I'll tell you a bit more about like the delegated and implementing acts, also, which also exist. And so, first of all, the regulation. Uh, this is something that is binding on all the member states of the EU. So everybody has to apply what is say in the regulation. And actually, it is self-executive. This means that what is said in the regulation directly applies in all the member states. There is nothing to do on the side of the public authorities to like implement this legislative in the whole country, which makes it different from the directive, because a directive requires what we call the transposition in the law of the member states. So a directive, what it says is just some, let's say, some kind of objectives. It's voluntarily vague. Let's say the vocabulary and the language use is kind of vague, so that the member states have some flexibility and some room of maneuver in the implementation of the EU law. And usually there's a deadline of about two years, uh, usually. The last one, the delegated and implementing act. This is like, I could do like a whole conference to detail how complex it can be. It's called comitology. But just so you know, it's something that's kind of like completes a previous legislation and uh, with some more specific uh, measures to really implement it correctly. So now that this is understood, I guess it's understood for everyone. Yeah, looks like, great. Um, so now that this is understood, uh, something else is, where does EU legislation apply? That's the EU, but the thing is that it wouldn't be the EU if it was that simple, right? So EU legislation actually applies in the 28 member states of the EU, and well, the UK is still part of the family for some months, and well, at that pace, actually, I'm not sure they will, like, maybe they will have to apply the ECC as well, actually. Um, but the EU legislation applies to uh, the country of the European Economic Area, which are Iceland, Norway, and Liechtenstein. Uh, though they are not members of the EU, they have to apply EU law on single markets, so only some parts, uh, which makes it complex. But that's not it, actually. It's even more complicated than that, because you will tell me, what about the like, outermost territories, like the overseas territories of some countries of the EU? And it's a question I get in my mailbox, something like every week. So once and for all, <laughs> um, EU legislation also applies in those nine territories, which are called the outermost regions of the EU. So there are the Canary Islands, uh, Madeira, the Azores, Guadeloupe, Martinique, the French side of the island of Saint-Martin, uh, French Guiana, the Réunion Islands, and Mayotte. So in those places, EU law apply. In other territories, like, I don't know, French Polynesia, or like the Dutch or British possessions in the Caribbean, the EU law does not apply, actually. So um, last introduction about how the EU works is who decides in the EU, because we hear a lot about like, the Commission and the Parliament and so on, but we don't really know what they do exactly and what is their role. So I just want to recall also very briefly what everybody does. So we have the main institution, which is the European Commission, uh, composed of EU commissioners and a lot of administration as well that work on elaborating the legislation and also making sure that the EU law is correctly implemented in the member states of the EU. Then we have two other main institutions, let's say. It's the European Parliament, which represents directly the citizens. So the members of Parliament are directly elected by all the European citizens. We'll have some elections next month. Um, I guess you've heard about it. And we have the Council of the European Union, which represents all the governments of the EU. And for EU legislation to be um, voted, basically, how it goes is that usually the European Commission proposes a directive or a regulation, and then both the European Parliament and the Council have to vote the same text in the same words. So they can amend this regulation or this directive, but they have to vote it with the same wording, which leads to sometimes super long negotiations between the two um, institutions. Are we good so far? I don't see any questions. That's great. So now, now let's talk about the EU legislation and what is now emergency calls. So most of you know already about the Universal Service Directive, which is the main reference for the moment about uh, calling 112 in the EU. But there are like other legislations. We had the e-privacy directive that is still uh, applied. 
We had, now we have the general data protection regulation. Uh, most of you attended the, the workshop and the, the presentation that was given uh, two days ago at this conference. If you haven't, you can still find the slides of the session uh, after this conference. So I really recommend everybody to have a look at what's the impact of GDPR for emergency communications. But that's not it. This is where we are today. So we have those legislation. Of course, there are lots more legislation, but those three main ones. And tomorrow, and what I'm going to talk about, we'll have the European Electronic Communications Code, which, is, which will replace the Universal Service Directive. We have the e-privacy regulation, which will replace the e-privacy directive. Now you know the difference between a regulation and a directive. And we, have, we will have like, a lot of more legislations. The European Accessibility Act and, that's super long to read, <laughs> a delegated regulation supplementing like, another directive. I'll go through that later. Of course, there's a lot more legislation, but I try to make it quite simple, but yeah. So let's talk about the European Electronic Communications Code, which is the main text about emergency communications in the future in the EU. So as I said, it's the new legislation, not only on 112, but on all telecommunications. So when we talk about 5G, about fiber and so on, and spectrum and a lot of things, it's in the European Electronic Communications Code. It's like a very big uh, legislative proposal. It was something like two or 300 pages, something very long, and there were some very long and intense negotiations about a lot of provisions in the text. As I said, it will repeal the Universal Service Directive, so the, this directive will cease to exist um, when the provisions of uh, the European Electronic Communications Code are in application. As I said, it's the main EU legislation on emergency communications, and it's a directive, which I guess now you know what it means, means that like, the member states have two years or more to implement it and to put that in their national legislation. And if you want to be cool in Brussels, you can just call it the EECC. Just so you know, just so you see here, I mean, I won't take like describe all the steps, but it took about four years, uh, two years, sorry, to vote this legislation. There was like very long negotiations between different institutions, different actors. We also mentioned that a bit during the uh, 112 award ceremony. And this is basically here that everything up happened. The interinstitutional negotiations we led to, which led to an agreement in June last year and some final votes in the fall of 2018. Okay. Let's move to concretely what is inside the EECC. And actually, let's talk first about vocabulary. The main change, actually one of the main change in the EECC is about that. So previous legislation was about emergency calls. So basically, I have a phone, I call 112. This will no longer be the case. Yes, you will still be able to call 112, but we'll have something else. We'll have the emergency communications. And so you will tell me, What's the difference, actually, between emergency calls and emergency communications? So it's written here, but it's like, it's Friday morning, it's super complicated. You won't have to go th through all of this because it's like super hard to understand. Uh, but yeah, here that helps a bit more, actually. Uh, a recital in a directive is something that helps to understand the purpose of a provision and that helps to also understand, like, how to interpret some uh, provision. So it's not binding in itself, but it's like kind of binding. And here we have some clue of like what the legislator meant by emergency communications. So emergency communications, as it's said here, is not only about calling 112. As it's clearly said uh, at the top of the recital 20, today there are like a lot more of technical possibilities to contact the emergency services. There are SMS, messaging, video, etc., cetera, et cetera. So that is, now, that is why, from now on, we will talk about emergency communications instead of emergency calls, which is something a bit dated now. So you will tell me, OK, now we understand that, but like, what does it mean concretely? Well, let's take the basics. In the European legislation, since the end of the uh, 20th century, there's a provision that says you should be able, anywhere in the EU, to call 112. Now, this article that is like the basis of 112 has been amended to say that um, you should be able to access the emergency services through emergency communications, which is why 
this is something that is becoming the new norm. It's no longer emergency calls, but emergency communications. So you'll get the basis. Now we can move to what is inside concretely. About color location, which is a bit big topic, probably you know already the Universal Service Directive from 2009 that says that all the emergency calls in the EU should be located. Location information should be sent to the emergency services. The problem, you know it better than me, is that the location that you get is usually quite inaccurate. It's about two kilometers in average, which is not great. And I'm talking here about people calling from their mobile phone. While there is today some possibilities to get all the kind of information that is much more accurate. That is why new legislation says that the location information that is sent to the PSAFs should include not only the network-based information, which is still useful, but also the handset-derived location information. What is handset-derived location information? Is basically what you have here on your smartphone, namely the GNSS, uh, GPS Galileo, and Wi-Fi information. So this is a bit hard to read. It's like EU law language, so I made it more simple. What's new? Emergency services in all the member states should make use of this handset-derived location information. An example of a technology that can make this real is AML, for instance. We had some discussions about that. It's, um, it stands for Advanced Mobile Location, and it enables you to uh, receive accurate location information from your smartphone in a very easy way. Um, then something else that is new is that um, in the past legislation, uh, it says that the establishment, the, the transmission of location information should be free to the PSAP. And now not only should be free to the PSAP, but also to the user. So it's something that is very important to have in mind when you work on improving uh, the legislation in your country. And uh, yeah, it should be provided for all kinds of emergency communications. Of course, it's the, if that's feasible. But just to mention here that, like, as I said, we don't talk anymore about emergency calls, but emergency communications. And the location information should be made available as well. So if you have SMS for, for instance, deaf people and hard of hearing, the SMS should also be localized. It's possible with AML, for instance. It's possible with other technologies, but just keep that in mind. Um, yeah, note that these obligations just cover the mobile operators and the member states. What the legislation says is that member states should make sure that the PSAPs can receive location information. But you will tell me, what about the handsets, actually? Are they obliged to provide this information to the emergency services? Well, let's look at another legislation, namely, I'm sorry, it's a very long title, the Delegated Regulation Supplementing the Radio Equipment Directive in order to ensure caller location in emergency communications and from mobile devices. Can we call that the E112 Delegated Regulation? Yeah, <laughs> good. And for this, I will give the floor one minute to Christoph Kautz, from, who worked at the European Commission and worked on, on this text. So, Christoph. Good morning. Good morning. Um, my name is Christoph Kautz, who work in the Commission. Um, so, uh, just a brief word uh, about this delegated act. So, Apologies for the long title, but this is how legislation is made. Basically, it's a piece of legislation uh, that makes sure that uh, smartphones um, are able to receive location information stemming from satellites, uh, so satellite navigation satellites like Galileo and Wi-Fi, that they are able to process this information and making it available for emergency communication. This piece of legislation was published in February entered into force in March this year and will have to be applied by handset manufacturers within the next three years. So basically when the uh, electronic communication code says location data to be made available from handsets wherever available, we will make it very much available through this delegated act. Thank you. Thank you, Christoph. Yeah. So to sum up what Christoph said, is something that is very it's a news from like the past weeks actually. So uh, something really new. And what it says really it's important is that as of the 17th of March 2022, all the smartphones that are sold in the EU single market will need to be equipped with a technology that is able to send the handset derived location information to the emergency services. Now there is AML. Maybe in 10 years it'd be something else. But all the smartphones should be equipped with something like that. And uh, the establishment of the location should make use 
of the European uh, satellite system, Galileo, which is not restrictive. So should consider the Galileo satellites, but not only if GPS provides good information, if Wi-Fi provides better information, yes, this will be sent to the emergency services, but Galileo should be looked at, which is great because Galileo has also been proven to be more accurate and uh, faster to get the location than with GPS if you use both constellations at the same time. So you will tell me, uh, well, I don't hear it from you, but I can read it in your face. It's like, well, like at the moment, like Android and Apple already have AML. So in the end, what does it change? Well, what I will tell you is that what it changes is certainty. You are sure that at no moment of the, like at any moment in the future, the older smartphones will have something like AML. And if there's a newcomer in the market in the next, last, next five years, which might happen, this newcomer will have to comply to this delegated regulation. So that is something that is very important and uh, well done to, to the European Commission for making that happen. Are we good with color location? Yeah, okay. Now we can move to another item that is in the EECC. It's public warning. Probably heard a lot about that already and just want to recall um, if that's not clear yet and that you see the article, um, there was basically nothing before in the European legislation. Now there is something that uh, there should be something called reverse 112 in all the member states of the EU and the territories that I showed like, uh, earlier. What does it mean, reverse 112, is that um, you should use the, like the telecommunications um, antennas and networks should be used to transmit public warning alerts. So that can be done through different uh, technologies. So as I said, public warning system should be placed in all the member states. As you read the text, you probably have some concerns when you see that um, member states will ensure that when public warning systems regarding uh, imminent disasters are in place. Why do we have this wording that is a bit strange? Is because the European Commission also doesn't have the competence to say that member states should have a public warning system. But like in actually all the member states have a public warning system. With SIREN, it's a public warning system. So in the end, it doesn't change much, but it's just to uh, ensure that the legal basis for which to act uh, was respected, which was the case. And this legislation, once again, it's only about telecommunication network and what actually INA is advocating and what you will all agree is that we should have a multi-channel approach. So the telecommunications networks is one thing. You should not ignore the rest. The goal in the end is to, to reach the whole population. So yeah, this I just said. And um, the alerts not only should well uh, warn the people in an area, but it should also take into account that, that there are sometimes some visitors in an area coming from different countries, and the visitors should also be alerted. And yeah, you probably know that two main technologies that provide this, the cell broadcast and the location-based SMS. I'll be very quick. Uh, yeah, then it's up to the member states, of course, to define uh, which technology they want to use. This is up to you. I'll be very quick because there's like, uh, another paragraph in the law that says that there's a possible alternative, which are mostly apps. Apps are great, but they don't reach the whole population, actually. But they can be a good added value. But like, there are very strong requirements for it to be an alternative. Is that it should be as efficient as network-based technology. Technically, this means that if a member state decides to say, no, we don't want state broadcast, we don't want localized SMS, and we'll make an app instead, should respect what I'm going to say. So should be should alert as many people in like the same amount of time as the other technologies. The reception of the alert should be easy, which means that you shouldn't like the citizens shouldn't be asked to uh, log in to an app, for instance. Uh, of course, the visitors entering the country should be uh, informed of like, how they can receive this alert. And um, transmission is supposed to be free to the user and compliant with privacy rules. Once again, I'll insist on that. What you see here is just if you consider an alternative as like cell broadcast to location-based SMS, which is actually very hard to reach. Actually, I don't really see any alternative available at the moment. But once again, it means that like, you shouldn't like, 
left the rest like away, you should have like a multi-channel approach. Is everything okay so far? Yeah. This is what I see from. <laughs> I'm going to talk now about the accessibility to people with disabilities. You probably know that in the current legislation, it is said that um, people with disabilities should have uh, an access to the emergency services that is equivalent to that enjoyed by the other end users, which is actually not very clear, actually, what do we mean by equivalent access. So this led to like, very different uh, implementations in the member states. What is said in the new legislation, new legislation actually adds what we described before, the emergency communications. For, as a reminder, emergency communications is this. So people with disabilities should be able to contact the emergency services by those means. For instance, SMS, messaging, videos, or the type of communications. I don't see facts in the list, so probably it's not considered anymore as like an equivalent access. So. Uh, yeah, basically, you, if you work in public authority of a member state of the EU, you will have to provide this, at least, well, to actually to everyone. So not only the people with disabilities, but to everyone. There should be different ways to contact the emergency services. And this is completed by another legislation called the European Accessibility Act, uh, which is a new law that is being ad adopted. Actually, it just, was just voted by the European Parliament a few weeks ago and the council will, will vote it like in the next days actually, and in the next three years actually. I mean, it says kind of the same as in the EECC, so uh, I won't bore you with that, but uh, just so you, you will see when you receive the, the slides, the, the whole text, and basically providers should provide real-time text, total conversation services, and so on. Uh, this is more about actually the, um, the products and services, while the EECC was about the the PSAPs and the emergency, uh, well, the communications network, actually. So that's why those two texts like, complete each other. And uh, people traveling to other member states also should have access to the emergency services as well. And um, this, of course, is very important. This should not uh, change completely the organization of the countries. Once again, this is not a competence of the European Commission to tell a country how it should be organized for the handling of emergency communications. Um, yeah, and that shouldn't prevent you from doing more, actually, than what is in the law. So, yeah, now we'll move to another big question that was heavily discussed during the negotiations of the EECC, which is access to 112 from online platform. Actually, it's something, when you, we talk about that, like, who should provide access to 112? Because in the past, it was very easy. I mean, you have a phone, you have to call 112. But today, we, like, we're surrounded by a lot of kind of like communication services. So we use not only phone to contact like our friends, but we use all those apps that are behind me. Like, yeah, Tinder is a communication service, actually. <laughs> uh, but like we use Messenger, Facebook Messenger, we use WhatsApp, we use Snapchat, I don't know all of them actually, but we use all these platforms. So like, who should be required to provide access to 112? And that's a bit a mess to see that. But let's first distinguish two categories. Yeah, that worked. So on one side, we have here what we call the number-based communication services. If you want to be cool in Brussels in the negotiation, just say in NBICS, very easy. Uh, well, like, just one thing, for Skype, I talk here about, like, Skype out, so what you use to, like, dial a number. So with those apps, Viber and Skype out, what you do, you dial a number. So you, like, it kind of provides you access to uh, PSTN. So those apps, that's why we call them, like, the number-based communication services. And since they, uh, they're not classic uh, mobile network operators, we also call them the network independent providers of NBICS. On the other hand, you have the apps that, where, like, where you don't dial a number, actually. Even on WhatsApp, you never dial a number on those apps. You, you use your other, other ways to contact people, and those are called the number independent uh, ICS. I, there is a typo. It's, um, the acronym is NIICS, actually. So forget about what is written. I won't bore you with all this text, though it's super interesting, but like, I made it easy for you, because it's Friday morning. And uh, basically what this says is that. 
So in principle, all the providers of number-based interpersonal communication services, such as Skype out or Viber, should provide reliable and accurate access to the emergency services. However, you know it better than me, it cannot always be the case. I mean, there are prob when you use this, there could be problems of transmission of location information, of the routing to the most appropriate PSAP, of possibility to call back and so on. So there's a lot of problems at the very moment now. But this might require uh, some standards to be implemented, and once this will be done, then those apps will have to provide access to 112 when all the problems will be solved. For the moment, there's no real like, possibility to do that, and that's why such providers are not really required to provide access to uh, emergency services when like, no such standard is implemented. And uh, you probably saw now when you log in on Skype, for instance, that it says that like, this does not enable you to contact 112. So yeah, like the such apps, if they can't provide access to 112, they should inform their users, which is very important. Let's talk about the rest, the number independent interpersonal communication services. It's written here, and it's actually pretty simple, is that for the moment, the access from like WhatsApp, Messenger, and so on is not mandated, so they're not, they don't have to provide access to 112. But maybe, who knows, in the future, maybe in five, ten years, like, nobody, will, like, nobody will use SMS, so nobody will use the, standard, like, the normal uh, phone uh, capability that you have in your smartphone. So uh, at that time, maybe like, we, will have, like, we will describe like, a threat to the access to the emergency services. And that's why the legislator, in a very good way, I think, made it possible to like, assess regularly whether like, access to emergency services is threatened by the use of such apps. And this is something that is uh, given to BEREC, which is the Bureau of European Regulators uh, in Electronic Communications. So it's kind of like the association of all the telecoms regulators in Europe. Are you OK so far? Sorry, it's a bit long, uh, but I'm, al I'm almost done. But I see that you get it. I see no face uh, with questions, so that's good. I'll very briefly describe now uh, other uh, provisions that were in the EECC. First of all, about the transnational emergency calls. It is something that like, you are probably faced with uh, on a daily basis, probably. Somebody that calls to report an emergency happening in another country, and if you walk in a PSAP, you know that it's very hard sometimes to forward it to another country. So uh, you probably remember that many years ago, INA uh, developed a database uh, to, like, that would be kind of a directory, actually, of the emergency services number of each country in Europe. And now, basically, this is in the legislation that uh, BEREC should maintain such a database. The advantages of that compared to the one at INA is that this is official and also probably more uh, secured, like cyber secured, and uh, very le less hard to uh, attack, and it's just better if it's official. So uh, this has been given to BEREC if such a database is not maintained by another member state, and actually, uh, sorry, by another organization, and it is actually maintained now by another organization. You probably followed that now uh, ECO, the European Communications Office, which is part of the CEPT is currently hosting what it's called now the PSAP directory. It's like, it's this kind of database actually. So if you have some questions about that, please contact us. We can put you in contact with uh, the CEPT to join this uh, database, this directory now. Something also that was discussed during the negotiations and uh, some of you I know are very sensitive to this topic is the direct access to 112. Actually, this is what is in the internal document of the European Parliament is if you have a problem, they yell 85 and 112, because 112 will not work. So most of you agree on the fact that like, this shouldn't exist and like, you should be able to contact 112 even from the private networks. Like, I'm not sure like, how many of you have checked in your hotel room how you can contact the emergency services? OK, none of Ah, one. Yeah, that's Good. <laughs> And it was actually not even clear in the instructions, but I think it's not 112. So the European legislation now says that member states should like, promote the access to 112 even from private networks. It's not a very strong requirement, actually. 
And I mean, it's a bit, let's say, sad to see that, but it was something that was very sensitive for the member states during the negotiations. So that's why like, what we end up with like, a provision that is not very binding, but at least there's like, a reference to that. But yeah, it's not a strong mandate. Sorry, Christina. <laughs> Um, another provision that is not in itself binding is the multilingual access to emergency services. Like now we travel like across Europe like super easily, but there's sometimes an issue of the language of the PSAPs. And while you can't really put in the law like that you require all the PSAPs to speak this language, this language, this language, there is now a mention in like non-binding references that uh, member states should consider the PSAPs ability to handle emergency communications in more than one language, which is, once again, something to really raise this topic with uh, the PSAPs. But the promotion of 112, we don't have TADAS everywhere across Europe, unfortunately, so 112 is still unknown to the majority of Europeans. Like, 49% of Europeans know that 112 is the single emergency number for the whole Europe. So uh, more should be done to promote 112, actually. And uh, before this responsibility was given only to the member states, now the legislation says that like, the Commission should support the action of the member states. And in addition, you have something also is that not, not only 112 should be promoted, but also the means of access for people with uh, disabilities. So that's it for the ECC. I just have one more thing to tell you before I end. And uh, I'll be very quick about that. It's called the e-privacy regulation. So you probably know already the e-privacy directive that um, basically gives some kind of like exemptions for the emergency services to get the color location of the person and uh, to get the uh, calling, like the phone number of the person calling, uh, even if he prevented this access. In the e-privacy regulation, this is a file that is currently being discussed. Uh, at the Council, so it will replace the privacy directive that I have just described. It's a regulation, so it's like self-executive, as I described before. There's no transposition that is required. And uh, basically, the idea is to keep this exemption in the text. And this is currently under discussion at the Council, so it's like between the governments of the EU. They are extremely slow to take uh, a position. It's more than two years that they can't agree on the same text. Not about like these exemptions, this should be quite, quite fine, but mostly about uh, other provisions in the text. Um, and this, well, you can see a bit what is in the text. It's like super hard uh, to understand, so I won't bore you with that now. Uh, this will actually be a bit clearer, but uh, it just says that it's also like more fit to uh, new kinds of locating people, so like AML and so on e-privacy regulation kinds of make it make this exemption like extended to uh, AML. So, uh, yeah, yeah. For instance, here it says directly to locate the terminal's equipment using uh, GNSS, and uh, so that's more fit to uh, the future of communication. So, I guess that is almost it. So, I just described a couple of legislations, depending on on your interest, there's like a lot more legislation that, that you can look at at the EU level. There's like a lot that is happening right now. Uh, there was this uh, rescue uh, legislation uh, that was discussed last year. It's about cooperation between emergency services on a more rescue side, but like it's what led to the European uh, Civil Protection Mechanism and so on, a great uh, tool of European cooperation between emergency services. So I'd recommend to have a look at this proposal if you're interested. Uh, there's some new legislation about cyber security, which on the short term will not have a direct impact to the emergency services, but potentially it can on the longer term. So uh, it's something that should, could be interesting for most of you. There's some legislation about drones that are happening. So there's a lot of things that is happening in Brussels, and it's not as boring as you would think it is. So that's for my conclusion, and I, I also want now to say that this is what will happen in uh, the future, and uh, this has been voted, but now it's up to you to implement it the best way possible in the member states of the EU. And I just want to recall the famous uh, quotation from Abraham Lincoln, is that now, like, the best way to predict the future is to create it. We can kind of predict, predict a bit the future, but it's up to you to create it, actually. And uh, I don't have the means to do like this, but like, <laughs> I prefer with the image. <laughs> I have no money to pay back the micro broken microphones and so on. So. <laughs> So that's it for my presentation. Is there any question?
I can drop it. No. <laughs> Thank you so much indeed for taking us on that tour uh, about how European legislation is made, um, what has happened in terms of uh, Ina's work and what might be there for the future for the next uh, European Union legislature. We have a little time for some questions to Bernoulli. Um It's not easy for me to see, but I think I can see a hand here. Please. Uh, if you don't mind, just to your left, more to the left, turn your heads to the left. I'm here. Okay, Hi. sorry. Okay. No worries. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I had just a quick question regarding uh, location. Uh, so carriers or MNOs are usually carry voice or SMS in the case of emergency calls, even if the handset doesn't have a mobile plan or if it doesn't have a SIM card, but they will not carry data. And in the case of a country implements AML using HTTPS and not SMS, yeah. that would mean that the AML would fail to send. And what, if that goes against the directive that says that emergency location should be sent at no cost, does this mean that carriers will now be forced to carry data in case of emergency calls? That is indeed a problem that is being looked out. Well, if we can call that a problem is that, as you rightly say, like. I mean, the establishment and transmission of location information should be free to the user. And potentially, if you use some data, it won't be free then. So this is a problem that is being looked at by the European Commission. Uh, and yeah, we'll see what, uh, what happens. But there's some work around it that is being done. Okay. Thanks a lot. Um, is it on? Yes. Uh, Benio, thanks for the presentation. I, I had the question regarding Galileo. Uh, is it exclusively for the EU member states or it could be used outside of EU, that service? It, of course, it could be used outside of the, of the EU, um, especially for the countries that have, let's say, uh, intentions to join the EU in the future or to get closer to the EU or like to get closer to the EU single market at least. Uh, then it's something really you should like, look at and uh, well, I know that a lot of countries like around uh, the European Union, but uh, that are still part of Europe, are just like looking at what's happening uh, in Brussels. So uh, yeah, definitely it could be used also. Please, yes. Um, to do with um, uh, alerts, it was alleged by one of the providers yesterday that only cell broadcast met the requirements of the European legislation. Yeah. Can you clarify whether that is actually the case? Well, I'm speaking here under the control of the European Commission, uh, but I don't think that's the case. Uh, the <coughs> law was clearly written so as to have different technologies possible. So not only cell broadcast, but also location-based SMS. Thank you. No, but it was, this was an excellent presentation, Benoit, and uh, congratulations. I just want to add one small point. In the first annex of the ECC regulation, uh, there are the provisions that the uh, member state can use when giving licenses for the networks. And there it says that the member state can uh, ask the uh, network operators uh, to establish rules uh, when uh, and how the authorities can use the networks in case of disasters, either to communicate between them or to communicate with the population. So it's, uh, it's something also important, not on everyday uh, operations, but uh, in case of uh, uh, disaster planning and provision. Thank you. Yeah, that's a very good point. Thank you. Thank you. I, I'm getting flashing lights. I think that our time is up, but if there are any more questions, one more question perhaps? <coughs> Seems not to be the case. So thank you uh, for your participation. Thank you again very much to Benwell for the excellent presentation. Thank you. Thank you.